Hi, this is Steve Kahn, and you're listening to Jazz Is Not What You Think. I am here today with the wonderful Steve Kahn, one of my favorite guitarists of all time. And we're going to talk about a lot of things, including his new album. Hi, Steve. Hey, Michael. How are you? Good to see you. Always good to see you. It's been too long. It's, it's, uh, I think the last time I talked to you, my hair was darker. Uh, well, mine was uh, probably for sure darker, and there was more of it. <laughs> well, great to have you here. And, and uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about the new project, new track that you did with, with uh, the wonderful singer from Take Six, Mark Kibble. And, um, but before we do, I wanted to uh, just say that, you know, I've been following your career since I started in the jazz business, and I've been really just enamored by the, the breadth of work you've done, the various styles you've done. You've, you, you really, you know, from, from the fusion stuff to being the most incredible session player to, to a lot of great solo projects that, uh, that should be in everyone's collection. Can you take us back to the beginning? Because you, you started out as a drummer, uh, I know, and that, that's an instrument that you, 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 you say it yourself, and, and I, can't, I don't believe it. You say you failed at it, and so you became a guitarist. But um, tell us about that transition, what was happening at the time, and, and bring us maybe back from, the, I think, late 60s, and then we'll get to current eventually. OK, well. Um it is kind of a funny story. I mean, uh, you know, when I was a, a kid, all I wanted to do was play sports. That, that's, that was, you know, I thought I was going to be a, I don't know, major league baseball player or something. And um, all of a sudden, was it 62 or 63? When the, when the Beatles hit, all my friends suddenly were picking up guitars and stuff and were, you know, singing and playing all these Beatles songs and they started forming bands and I was kind of left out left out because I didn't play anything uh, although you know my father had shoved me at the piano from age five to twelve mm -hmm. but I, I didn't you know really want to do that so um, so what happened was is um, I, I started like I looked at the landscape of the bands and you know nobody seemed to have a drummer but they had you know guitars so i said well that looks like the easiest thing to do so i'll play drums and so uh you know my father he um he said well you're not going to play drums i'm not going to get you anything unless you go take lessons and so i i said um oh man here we go again so I said, but okay, because he knew all the the great. Uh, I mean, my father's uh, for the people who don't know is Sammy Khan, the lyricist who wrote all these, you know, songs for Sinatra and. Count You're Versace. so he modest. The, the lyricist, one of the one of the greatest songwriters of all time. But okay. So so and of course, Dad knew all the musicians, and he could you know probably talk to five or six drummers, get a snare drum from one guy, a cymbal from a, you know that he could do that kind of stuff. So. He, he drives me out somewhere in, in the valley in Los Angeles for uh, my first drum lesson. And I walk in the room and there's no drums. There's just a little kind of circular black rubber, what they you know, call practice pad and two chairs. And so in, in walks the teacher and he says, okay, hi, I'm so-and-so. Hi, I'm Steve. I said, where are the drums? He says, oh, we're a long way from that. <laughs> and so he says, first, we're going to start by practicing the, the rudiments on the pad. And so I you know, started to realize, wow, this is really hard. And so, but I ended up, dad you know, put together some drums for me. And I, you know, I was in these kind of crummy bands and stuff. And by some miracle, uh, I started like, I guess you could say I was sort of a, a groupie. Uh, I started following this band, the Chantays, who had had this huge hit, Pipeline, uh, in, in the 60s, a big surfing hit. And we all became friends, and I knew all the guys and stuff. And they were actually the first guys who really turned me on to jazz records, like Wes Montgomery, etc. 
it was all through these <laughs> surfing musicians. Surf music. Yes. So um, somehow their drummer quit. And I don't know why they asked me to join of all people. And so I was in this band and suddenly like, and they were really good. And so I'm touring with them and I can barely play. I, I never could really <laughs> play a role and nothing, but I, it was like survival. So at a certain point, um, and, and this is really funny. Um, one, we, we ended up getting a, um, a deal with um, what was it? Warner Brothers Records, Warner Brothers Reprise. Mm -hmm. Then you know, they would just do singles and stuff. And mm -hmm. so um, they said, well, you, know, we can't, you can't be the Shantays anymore. So we came up with this name, The Ill Winds, and that's what we were going to be. I wish I knew you at the time. I, I have a perfect name for the band. <laughs> well, the Bleach Boys. Well, well, that I don't think that would have been too good. But so, because everybody, we were sort of trying to play, I guess, some kind of folk rock or something. And so, mm -hmm. the first single we did for Warner Brothers was produced by Lee Hazelwood, who was the guy who um, did, you know, these boots are made for walking with Nancy. Mm -hmm. A tons of big hit things. And so, I quickly found out. Uh, that I wasn't good enough to play drums on the song we recorded. And, um, and maybe someone like Jim Gordon had to come in and play the <laughs> drums. And I had to sit, I think they let me play tambourine or something, which I also couldn't do. So that was a real wake up call in a certain way about how things go. And then believe it or not. So nothing happened with that single. Then we had called to do another one. And the producer is a piano player. His name was Mike Rubini. And he walks in to my mother's house with some guy who I'd never seen a guy like this before in my life, uh, dressed like that with this insane, huge crucifix. And who's that guy? Mac Rabinek, who was oh, wow. way before Dr. he John. became Dr. John. And Mac had these songs. And of course, for him, with all the soul that he has, to have the whitest possible guys trying to sing the way with his kind of inflection, mm -hmm. uh, it, it must've been killing him. So we did a song, one of his songs called uh, A Letter. And uh, that, that was the one we did. A, we did another one called Black Widow Spider too. I don't know if he ever recorded those years later, but anyway, nothing happened. So one day I'm sitting in my mother's house, my parents had, were divorced by then. And I've got this nice set of drums, beautiful Ludwig set of drums. And I had just bought a bunch of albums and I'm, I'm listening to uh, Grady Tate playing drums on West Montgomery's uh, Moving West album on Caravan, which is the opening track, you know, fast as lightning. And as much as I was loving it, I almost started to cry because I was like, I can't play the drums. Listen to this guy. And I went, sat down on my drums for a second, and I just sat there for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes just looking at them. And I, all I could say was, I can't play. And so I think I'd started college by then. I was at UCLA. And don't ask me how this happened, but I just decided, you know, I want to be a, a great jazz guitar player. And so I changed my major to music, which was all, another impossible thing to do, really crazy thing to do. And uh, so that started me down the path to where you, you know me. But the ironic thing about the drum story is many, many years later, maybe it was the 70s. It must have been the 70s. So I'm on some session and Steve Gadd is, is the drummer. And so uh, in New York, it, which is you know, not very much not like L.A., you know, everything that comes in is either at the studio to begin with or they rent things. Guys don't arrive with a truck, you know, with their, their roadies and bring in their, all their gear. It doesn't work like that here, or at least it didn't back then. And so Steve Gadd's drums hadn't arrived, and all that was there was a snare drum sitting in front of him. And so the rest of us are all, you know, plugging in guitars and that stuff. And Steve sits down 
and he just starts to play at the snare drum. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to all this music coming from this, this you know, obviously ridiculous, the great musician, but he's just, he's playing music just on the snare drum. And suddenly I, I went back to that lesson with that guy and the practice pad and I said to myself, that's what he was talking about. You just, mm-hmm. you know, you just didn't get it. And I think that's one of the great lessons of my life is that sometimes you can be in the right place. Somebody's there ready and willing to teach you, to help you, but you're just not ready to receive what they're bringing. And, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what, that's what happened. And so, you know, it's easy to say, well, I, I'm sure you weren't, as awful on the drums as you say you were, but I was pretty awful. And so, Mm -hmm. but everything sort of came around full circle, just sitting there. I was a guitar player then, but looking at Steve doing that, I I really understood like, this is what the guy was talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's, that's great. You know, the, so when you first started playing guitar, um, and that's how I heard you early on the early projects that I heard you, your solo projects were mostly electric guitar. Yeah, I, actually, the, the first thing I think that I did where I was recorded as like like an artist was uh, I'd been touring, uh, doing acoustic guitar duets with Larry Coryell, and mm-hmm. we made uh, this live album called Two for the Road," mm-hmm. which some people uh, still really revere. But uh, mm-hmm. that was like '74 or something, so. It's funny how it started with that. And and yes, all the, the things after that, the stuff with the Brecker Brothers and this one Steve Marcus album, which we did, did around the same time, uh, which had um, Steve Gadd, Will Lee, Don Grolnick, Steve Marcus, and me. And so uh, we did that record. But but yes, all the... from. Those records that I did in the, in the 70s for Columbia, Tightrope, uh, The Blue Man, and Arrows, those were all, you know, a kind of uh, electric fusion of, of the time. Um, and what, what's kind of interesting, which is, it's followed me my whole career. Like I said, when I got dropped by Columbia Records in 1980, I was just lost. I mean, I, I really didn't know, you know, well, like what's going to happen to me? I thought my life was on this trajectory into off to great places, but kapoof, you know, is gone. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks to a keyboard player who just passed away recently, Warren Bernhard, who was my next door neighbor. He had been listening to me practicing all these uh, tunes on acoustic guitar, all these monk tunes. And he said, man, you got to go record this stuff. I said, really? He says, he says, I never heard somebody play, you know, monk tunes like that. So mm-hmm. I, I had a friend who um, had been an assistant engineer on the Columbia Records, and he said to me, he said, anything you want to do, let me know. I'll get us in. Uh, I'll get a great rate. And we went in one weekend, and we recorded what became evidence, and um, which kind of really sort of changed my life in a certain way, but it, it was like a cleansing. You know, I, I went back to all the reasons that I wanted to play in the first place. Cause that album had obviously all these monk tunes, but tunes by Horace Silver, Wayne Shorter, Lee Morgan, Joe Zawinul and Randy Brecker, the tune of Randy Brecker's. So uh, then after that, uh, this is where things really, really changed for me. And I think it was the beginning of, of finding myself uh, I made some phone calls to Anthony Jackson, Steve Jordan, and Manolo Badrena. And wow. out of that became Eyewitness. And those records that we did together, which was basically just, we jammed up some stuff and I thought it was good and, and we found a way to get ourselves recorded. But that record, the first Eyewitness record, that really changed my life. And I think mm-hmm. if you look at that record, and you could even, you know, sort of mix in evidence too, but, and you follow them right to the present, everything makes sense. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting because as a, as a listener, that's the way I saw your career uh, without knowing the backdrop. And that is the earlier years with Columbia, this electric sound, this very Brecker Brothers kind of thing happening, which was yes. very cool and still is cool. To, it's actually retro cool now. People like going back and listening to that. Then when I heard evidence, the one thing about evidence, in addition to it being more acoustic than I had been used to from Steve Kahn, um, there were songs that in the hands of another guitarist, it would have come across as just an album of acoustic guitar doing standards. But no, not so with Steve Kahn. It's, it's, I would say it's one of your albums, if not the album, that you can listen to over and over and over again and never get tired of it. Every note, and you, you say you did it over a few days, Every note in that album as a listener is purposeful. And you can, you can hear it, it, just the love and, and the, the articulation in that album. And then as you moved with Manolo and the other guys in, in that direction, you stayed there for a while and that sort of became the sound of Steve Kahn. So if someone, it's kind of like Miles Davis in a way, where when someone says, I love Miles Davis, what period did you like? Was it with Gil Evans? Was it, was it the electric stuff? Was it kind of blue? And so there are different periods. You can say the same thing about the Beatles. I mean, when people say they like the Beatles, did they like, you know, She Loves You? Or was it Abbey Road? Or was it the White Album? Because there are many different directions that those artists took, like you, that it's kind of a period. There's, a, there's the Columbia years. There's the the transition with evidence. There's the, the uh, eyewitness direction that you took. And then to bring everyone to current, this new project, um, obviously not the first time for those who you aren't familiar with some of your other work with vocalists. One of the things that really sticks out, which I'd love for you to talk about, is the thing you did with Gabrielle Anders with the, the uh, Beach Boys cover, which I thought was the best interpretation of that song ever. Tell us about how that happened. Well, that was, um, it's funny, it's, um, it's such a, you know, bittersweet uh, project. Uh, at the time, there were um, a lot of these, um, I, I guess you could say, things going on where somebody, a producer, would assemble various artists, play the music of so-and-so. And so I had done, I'm not sure what the chronological sequence of any of them was, but I had done one where, uh, you know, Mike Minieri wanted uh, 10 guitarists to play their favorite Beatles song. Mm -hmm. So I was a part of that. And uh, it was a wonderful project. And um, I did a, a sort of a, a weird George Harrison medley. And lucky for me, I did it on the same day. Uh, where we shared the same rhythm section as John Abercrombie. So we both played with Mark Johnson and Peter Erskine. And I added in Nana Vasconcelos uh, for his particular brand of uh, genius. So there was that one. And then, uh, let's see, Blue Note did this record where they, um, they called it Jazz to the World, where various artists uh, played Christmas songs for charity. And we recorded my father's one real Christmas song, The Christmas Walls. It was me and the Brecker Brothers. So we did that. And so around that same, and then the, the last one, um, Hal Wilner was putting together a record of various artists play the music of Thelonious Monk. And so he'd asked Donald Fagan, you know, would you like to do something? And Donald said, yes, I'll do something, but only if I can do it with Steve Kahn. It's one of the few times anybody's ever said something like that. And so I did an arrangement for us of uh, Monk's Tune Reflections, because Donald was a big fan of evidence. And so we did it very much in that style. And so uh, Tim Weston, who is a wonderful guitar player and a, and sure. a really great producer, uh, Tim was a huge Beach Boys fan. Uh, and you'd think that I was, but I really wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. so he asked me, he said, you know, would you, I'd love for you to be a part of it. 
And so I said, wow, I, I can't think of a song I would want to do. And then he suggested some. And I started listening to, uh, there was something about Don't Worry Baby that I really liked. And at this time, I was just completely engrossed in and captivated by the music and the harmonies of Claire Fisher. That was, mm -hmm. that was like everything to me. Like thinking, you know, first of all, just understanding the, the keyboard aspects to it all, but also is it possible to do anything like that with the guitar? And so I, I you know, kind of felt like, well, that's, it would be my dream if I could do that. Um, but I digress here. So anyway, um, I crafted this arrangement based on a lot of Latin music and Claire Fisher's harmonies. And so uh, with the help of the great Oscar Hernandez, who has the Spanish Harlem Orchestra now, uh, Oscar helped to put together the right guys to play this arrangement of, of Don't Worry Baby. So I, I had Rob Mounsey on keyboards, but then I had Papo Pepin on conga, Mark Quinones played timbal and uh, over to the end, of course, Ruben Rodriguez on bass. And so we did this piece. And I, at the time I knew Gabriela Anders was gonna, gonna sing it. And, uh, you know, we just did it. And she, she's so fantastic. You know, uh, she added so much to the ideas that I had. And it's really, um, you know, one of my favorite projects that, uh, that, that I've ever done. And, and it, it kind of um, brought me deeper into the world playing with real, the really great Latin musicians, which is, as you know now, has followed me sure. through everything. No, I, it, it, that, that album, uh, that whole Tim Weston album, I think I, Trying to remember, uh, wouldn't it be nice? I think is the name of the record. Yes, that's it. Um, and uh, and Tim, like well, actually, Tim pitched it to me. I had a record label wow. at the time, uh, and uh, it was in the Verve Group. And I don't know if you if you remember, but Rittenauer and I started a label at the in the Verve Group, and we signed. He did a bunch of various artist projects. They were really produced by him. They were really more like Lee Rittenauer albums, but a twist of Jobim, yes. a twist of Marley, a twist of Motown. And I loved the, 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 uh, Tim's project, particularly your song. And I said, um, this would be a great a twist of the Beach Boys. So that was what I was trying to get done. But it, the timing was wrong, and, and, and I think at that time we were chasing Al Jarreau and uh, it never happened. And, you know, he called me one day and he goes, I, I think Bruce is going to sign me for this album. And thank God he did. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Tim, Tim's great. And that was a really great project, but your, 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 your addition to that album, I think is what made that, that, that project super strong and Gabriella as well, which brings me to your new project with Mark. Um, again, a little bit of a different twist for you. It's, it's moving in a little bit different direction, but, but, and I, I love take six and I love Mark singing. Um, I'll tell you a, a, a funny take six story. Good. Um, uh, and then I want to hear about your meeting Mark and how that all worked out. But, um, uh, take six, I think was originally signed to Warner in Nashville. Mm -hmm. The original uh, kind of uh, just voice project, um, doing a cappella. I think it was just called Take Six, Do Wapity Wap Bop or something. I can't remember the name of the title, but it was it was just as spectacular. I actually got an advance of the project. I think the guy, really nice guy from Warner Nashville back then, Chris Palmer, um, sent me an advance on cassette, and um, I forget where I was. I was I think I was at a festival, and Joe Sample and I went to the pool. And I was listening on a cassette Walkman, and I had this advance from Warner Nashville, even though at the time uh, Joe was signed to Warner uh, in California, Burbank. And um, I said, hey, Joe, you want to hear something? And I, it was the, the debut Take Six album, and he takes my Walkman and puts my headphone. 
and with a couple of expletives that you know Joe was really good at. He was like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> you know? And uh, I said, it's that, that take six, that, that kind of gospel a cappella band. He goes, man, he goes, I love these guys. Well, as the story goes, um, his next record, I think, was Spellbound. He had take six singing on that record. And it was a really cool track called U-Turn. And one day I'm in my car, there's a lot of name drops here, and I apologize for this, with no. Bob James. And I say, Bob, you got to hear this, this Joe Sample track. And by, at that time, Bob was at Warner. And I got the advance of the Spellbound album from Joe Sample. And I played him this track with Joe with Take Six. And you could see Bob's eyes light up. And there was kind of a magic happening there where Take Six was just doing some pretty remarkable things. And now here we are, you know, 25 plus years later, and Mark surfaces with a project with you. And, and I, I, I kind of chuckled when I saw it. I said, Mark Kibble, yeah, I, I always loved his singing. Let's see what they're going to do here. And of course, the track speaks for itself. Tell us about how, how that happened. Can I... Uh... You know, it's funny when you have a conversation like this with somebody, you know, an old friend and stuff, uh, names pop up and, you know, recordings pop up and uh, you don't have to use this, but just <laughs> just for fun. So sure. believe it or not, you mentioned Joe Sample and, you know, one of the first groups I loved growing up in California was the Jazz Crusaders, not the Crusaders, sure. the Jazz Crusaders. And so I, you know, I, I knew who they all were. And I ended up, before I left California, playing on Wilton Felder's first uh, solo record as a tenor player, uh, which, of course, uh, none of us musicians got any credit for. So nobody ever knew that I, I played on. Uh, but fast forward to somewhere in the, uh, I don't even remember. What year, do you remember what year Spellbound was? Spellbound, I want to say it was... Uh... In, it was in the '90s or late '80s. It was it was around 1990, 90, 90. Okay, so believe it or not, '91. For those sessions, Tommy Lapuma calls me, and he says, "I want you to come play on on Joe Sample's new album. It's going to be you, uh, Mar Omar Hakim, and Marcus Miller." And Omar and, and Marcus and I were, you know, good friends and we played together a lot. And it's really funny. I mean, you know, Joe was already in this area that was to become or was, you know, smooth jazz, which I, I didn't really like any of that stuff. But mm -hmm. I just felt like, well, you know, let's just go play music. And so anyway, I go there the first day and, you know, we're introduced and I tell Joe you know, how much uh, I love the Jazz Crusaders and stuff. And, you know, it wasn't the friendliest guy to me. I think, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think he didn't even want to have a guitar player at the sessions. Uh, that was Tommy's idea. So we worked really hard all day. And I felt like he wasn't enjoying any of it, you know, Marcus and Omar thought it was great what we were doing. And so I left the studio that night with a really bad feeling. I haven't had it too many times, but it's happened before. And, and you know, it'll happen to you. And so I get home and um, my wife uh, says to me, well, you know, how did it go? And I, I said, um, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I, just don't have a good feeling about it. I, we worked really hard. I thought we got some good stuff, but I don't think Joe was happy with anything. And so Nancy and I went out to dinner and I come home and the first message on the machine I hear is Tommy Lapuma's voice. And he says, Steve, it's Tommy. Listen, please call me uh, when you get this. Uh, and before you come to the studio tomorrow, please call me. I need to speak with you. And so Nancy's standing next to me listening to this. And she says, 
well, what's that? And I said, he's going to tell me, uh, in essence, I'm fired. Or, you know, Joe doesn't come tomorrow. Don't, yeah. <laughs> and so she says, oh, Steve, you're so negative. that Nobody feels that way about you. I said, no, these things happen. I said, you just know it. And sure enough, I call Tommy, and that's what he says. And I said, okay. I said, no problem. I said, um, but I'm going to come to the studio way before anyone gets there. I'm going to pack up all my stuff and get it out of there. I, I don't want to be in some uncomfortable situation. And in the end, um, you know, they finished the album with just the three of them. And, of course, later Michael Landau, I think, played on, on most of it uh later so anyway that's when you mentioned spell that i had to tell you that story because uh, no, every great. time i think of that i think about you know getting fired um, <laughs> and uh which i think for young musicians is a great lesson because it, it just shows you that this can happen it can happen to anybody i mean sure. you know, people get erased and replaced all the time so anyway back to the <laughs> so uh, so so, so Mark Kibble, Take Six, uh, this track, obviously it was a track, the song itself is a classic that you love, and uh, I'm sure Very there's much. a great story behind it. Well, yes. I mean, this is one of those things where, you know, no matter how deep one is into, you know, some area of jazz, um, you know, the musicians of my generation were all a product of uh, listening to, to all kinds of music on the radio, R&B, uh, rock, pop, everything. And so, um, and of course, I'm my father's son. So I grew up listening to all the great songs in our house, all the standards, everything, you know, uh, whether it's Sinatra or Peggy Lee or, uh, you know, Julie London or Tony Bennett. We heard all of them all the time. So um, I love songs. I, I, I'm, that's never changed. And so somewhere in the, um, in the 70s, you know, I just arrived here in New York, uh, some album comes out uh, by this, this blues phenom, uh, Shuggy Otis. Actually, it's pronounced Shuggy Otis. I, I finally found out that Shuggy is sort of connected to sugar. So it sounds like that. So Shuggy... Uh, makes a couple of records. And the second one was called um, Inspiration Information, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, am I reversing it? Is it Information Inspiration? I, I think it's Inspiration Information. So mm -hmm. on this record is this song called Island Letter. And it, you know, it's, it's a love song that's plain and simple. It's a beautiful little love song. Very strange little love song because it really only has two verses. There's no bridge. Mm -hmm. it, that's it. And you know, it's, 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 a, it's just a wonderful, I always loved it. I never, ever, ever thought I'll do something with this someday. But you know, you file these things away. They're in your, your bank of, of wonderful memories of music and songs. And so a couple of years ago, uh, a great arranger from England got in touch with me. He's doing a, a big band this is all connected to our conversation here, believe it or not. Uh, so he's doing a, a big band Steely Dan tribute of all things. And he calls me uh, to ask questions about uh, one of the famous tunes that was recorded for Gaucho that never got finished and never was released. Um, it was a song called, um, oh geez, uh, Kuli Baba. It was one of four songs that I played on that just, never got finished, which is sort of in this weird underground of Steely Dan lore that where all their goofy fans, they know everything about these things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I tried to help him out with that song. And uh, I, uh, he, he had already done the arrangement. And he sent me the track. And he didn't ask me to do it. I just played on it. I sent it to him. And, and he, he loved it. He was happy with it. And so he, I said, well, what are you doing? And he says, well, you know, I've got all these arrangements. And he says, uh, and I've got Hamish Stewart singing on three songs, uh, maybe four, but I don't have, I'm you know, trying to find singers, you know. So we talked about it. 
And this is where I started brainstorming with Jimmy Haslip, a great bass player. Most people know Jimmy from Yellow Jackets, but a million other things. Love Jimmy. And so Jimmy, we start, um, we kind of jokingly started to call ourselves the Mitzvah Brothers because we were trying to like sort of join all these people together. We weren't asking for anything, just trying to make marriages of mm -hmm. uh, musical tastes. And so I heard uh, the, the trumpet player arranger in England, his name is Ruben Fowler, and mm -hmm. R-E-U-B-E-N Fowler. And so uh, I heard his arrangement for Asia, and I started thinking about this, and I just said, man, Mark Kibble would just kill this. And so I didn't know Mark. And Jimmy heard the arrangement. He says, I hear it. He says, let me, uh, I'll give you Mark's number. I'll call him first. And so Jimmy hooked me up with Mark. I sent Mark the tune. Mark loved the arrangement of Asia. And of course, what he did to it is, is amazing, completely amazing. So we worked on this together. And um, as that project is, is concluding, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm speaking with him and I had this idea. I, I don't know why my mind drifted back to Shugi Otis's Island Letter, but I said, Mark, I said, I've got this song that I always loved. I think we could do something really great with this. Can I send it to you, the original version to you, and just see if you feel something from it. And if you are into it, I'll create, you know, a beautiful satin pillow of harmony, and your voice will be the jewel that sits on top of it. And so uh, I sent it to him. He writes me back. He says, I get it. I, I love it. Let's do it. And so that was that was the beginning. And we went through, you know, I went through this stages of working on this arrangement and um you know what what he did is just so uh breathtakingly beautiful and so creative uh it, it's you know it's like taking something where the rich harmonies are, are there it's just he made it like a takes it to the next level yes the now he's high levels. and and you know what it's interesting you mentioned jimmy uh, Jimmy Haslip, a friend of mine, I, I love Jimmy. And, and you know, you talk about Steely Dan and, and all the things you've done that are Steely Dan related, if you would. Uh, and uh, I contacted Jimmy, and he'll, he'll, he'll corroborate this story, about 20 years ago. This is before Blue Canoe Records. And I said, uh, Jimmy, like you said, Steve, you're, you're the connector. You're, in fact, I think Steve Kahn... Uh, Jimmy Haslip and Michael Fagan, we should be the, the mitzvah triplets. Um, and, and I said, you can connect the dots with a lot of very talented people to come up with projects that are, they're, they're obviously based in jazz, but they're not, they're not jazz. But because they have jazz players, kind of like Donald did with Steely Dan, that it, it just takes it to a different level and they can be pop, they can be funk, they can be blues, um, and you can connect the dots and we can find really great singers like a Mark Kibble. Um, and he goes, yeah, I really love that idea. I said, well, think about it. So every time I talk to Jimmy, I always say, remember that idea we came up with? And I think in some ways um, that percolated and he thought about it and he thought of when you came up with the idea this is something that I've been hoping that Jimmy would get involved with for, like I said, for a couple decades. And your, my, my passion to do something like this came out in, in your, your song. And I think, I think there's a, I think there's a, it, it requires the right people, of course. But I think there is an interest in the, the consumer, the fan, the listener, for music like you just made. And that is, you come from a, a, a pretty serious musician place, if you would. Um, but you don't necessarily, like a lot of great music out there, have to be for the aficionado, for someone who's a musician. It's, 
it just, it feels good when the fan listens to that music. And like Mark did and you did, it takes that song that probably a lot of people have not heard of, even though I, I remember that song. I love that song. Yeah, so um, I mean, it takes it to a different level. 50 years old. Yeah. And, and it, it's, you know, it's sort of like I, I did that when I referred to before a twist of Jobim. Our, you know, I'm a huge fan of Antonio Carlos Jobim, as millions of people are around the world. Everybody. And yet a lot of Jobim songs the masses haven't heard of. They know the girl from Ipanema, but they, they may not know, you know, Stoneflower or some of the other great Jobim tunes. Um, and when we presented the idea uh, to Polygram in the Verve group before it became Universal, um, they weren't really happy to know that the very first project we were going to do on this new label that they funded was a tribute to Antonio Carlos Jobim. Again, that sort of various artist thing. Um, but I reminded them that these will be songs that most of the people that buy the album would have never heard of. And we're going to do a twist of those songs so that they may want to go back and listen to the original now that they've heard this great version. Hopefully, you know, the, the, the version that we create stands for itself. But I think that's, that's what you achieved so well with this Island Letter track that you created. So the question that I have, and I didn't realize it until I did a little deeper digging, and that is, this is a one track project, but are you gonna do more? Um, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, that's really sort of the, the beauty of it. And, and if, if, if I may, you know, kind of the heartbreak of it, because uh, when um, these last four uh, recordings of mine between uh, 2011, 2011, 14, 16, and 19, uh, parting shot, uh, subtext, uh, backlog, and uh, patchwork, which was in 2019. Uh, at that point, I mean, I'd been personally, you know, financing my, my records from my life savings. And at the end of patchwork, I felt like uh, without getting myself in serious trouble, where if I got really ill or something, I don't want my son to have to be taking care of me and paying for it or something. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got to stop here because my nest egg is in a, could be in a perilous place. And so I knew that likely is not patchwork is probably the last full album I'll ever be able to, to make that way. Um, you know, I know what's going on out there. I mean, there's nothing's going to drop out of the sky and, you know, someone's going to finance some Steve Kahn album. It's not going to happen. So when um, Mark and I started this, uh, you know, we were doing this, uh, you know, for the love of the song. Just mm -hmm. do, do good work, period. Do the best work you can, but just do good work. And so even with that noble kind of effort, when we got done, I'm sitting there, you know, it's mixed, it's mastered. Here's this beautiful uh, piece of music. Yes, uh, you know, a little long to be a, a pop hit, you know, six minutes and 45 seconds. And thank you to you and, uh, you know, Jazz is and the, uh, you know, your CD sampler where you, you know, you're presenting the whole thing just as is to your listenership. And, and so, um, but I said to myself, I said, well, what are we gonna, what am I going to do with this? I said, and I, I, I felt like this is a beautiful piece of work and I'm not just going to give it away. I'm not going to do that. Because if you just put it out there and put it up at Facebook or YouTube and stuff, and we, you know, we made a video, we did all this stuff. And again, our pal Jimmy Haslip, I, I had sent it to him, not necessarily um, looking for something uh, just to see if he had any ideas, I said, and I asked him, I said, do you think Joseph Patrick Moore at Blue Canoe would take on a one song project? And he said, well, let me, let me send it to him and let's see what he says. And for some reason, you know, God bless him, uh, you know, Joseph loved it. And he said, let's do it. He said, I don't do singles. I've never done. He said, yeah, I said, well, maybe 
if we don't call it a single, a, a one song project. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so it had a place to exist, you know, a real record company, a, uh, you know, some place to protect it. For, I mean, there's nothing any of us can do to stop, you know, what's going on out there. I mean, sure. uh, and I think if, you, if you'll allow me, I mean, I think sure. the, the, the tricky, the tricky thing about where the music business is, and this isn't just for jazz artists and jazz people and jazz lovers, is that, you know, aside from that, and you and I know this all too well, I mean, we're just about at the end of the CD era. I mean, you know, computers don't have CD players. Cars don't have CD players. Most people don't have CDs in their home. Most people don't even have a real stereo system. Nothing. So the people who care about great audio, um, they're really... There are not too many of them out there. So, I mean, to tell you the truth, if you ask me, Steve, how many musicians that you know uh, have a stereo and a CD player? I bet I probably can't count five. Uh, it's really sad. So the question becomes to the young person, the young listener or younger listener, you know, people who have grown up in this uh, digital age of... Uh, you know, streaming and the internet and everything, that person says, well, why, you know, why would I pay whatever, $12 for CD, $9, whatever, whatever it is, or 99 cents for a song at iTunes or $1.29? Uh, why would I pay? Why would I want to do that? I can you know, listen for free on Spotify. I can listen for free on YouTube all day. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's kind of the problem that, uh, we all face and there's nothing, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, once, you know, file sharing began, that was the end. I mean, and nothing's the, the record companies, the publishers, the, nobody's come up with an equitable way of trying to make, make it so that the musicians, the companies, the songwriters, the publishers, everybody gets paid. Uh, we're still, I you know, light years probably from seeing that happen, and you know it's it's a it's a sad situation. So back to Island Letter, all I cared about is that in whatever way I can, uh, I wanted to try to protect it uh, mm -hmm. because you know what Mark did is just so breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, you know, I just don't want to give that away for nothing, even though. Once we put it up in YouTube, there's no stopping. You know, sure. People can just go and listen, which is great. I'm happy they can do that. Thanks for the mile stories. Thanks for the incredible music discography that you have, Steve. Um, I love your playing. I hope you do make more albums because I love listening to your albums. Every time I get one, it's like getting a present in the mail. Uh, and, uh, and we should do this again. Well, it was, this was so much fun. It was, it was a great pleasure. And, you know, it's just great to reconnect and that, you know, all these, uh, even though there's lots of time in between things, uh, it's nice to have a, a warm relationship with, with you uh, that just, you know, kind of spans all of this time. And, uh, you know, nothing much changes. And uh, I'm very grateful for that and, and, and really happy about it. It's really nice. Well, thanks. And we'll do it again. Until next time.